Welcome to this lesson on getting started with C. If you've never programmed before, don't worry. We're going to create your first program, and then we're going to create several more until you're comfortable with the process. One of the process or problems people have when they first say, I'm going to learn a new programming language, is getting the software they need, the programming language itself, installed on their system. We're going to see that there's a lot of C compilers that you can download and install on your system, and the good news is a lot of them are free. But we're also going to see that there's several web-based compilers that you can just go to a web address and start typing in your code and you can actually run it without ever installing any software on your computer. It's a super convenient way to get started. Ultimately, you're going to want to have a C compiler on your system. But as you're first getting started, you can be working within 30 seconds and have your first C program up. And so we're going to drill down through that process, get you running. And so hold on, we're going to learn about what our program should look like the structure of a C program, the different kinds of errors that we can encounter from syntax errors to logic errors, and how we correct those and debug the logic errors. And so let's go ahead and get started. I always get the question of why should I learn C? There's lots of programming languages out there. Maybe I should start with Java or C++. And one of the things I'll tell people is that there's an inherent built-up demand for C programmers um, because knowing C opens the door you're quickly knowing JavaScript, quickly knowing Java, quickly knowing C++, quickly knowing C Sharp. And so C has a history of being ideal for embedded systems and real-time systems, and those are still in use today. And one of the good news is that programmers can learn C quickly. And once you do, it's going to open the doors. Um, C++, C++ or C Sharp will be much easier to learn after you have your C background. And so we'll get started with C. I always say that your first programming language takes a long time to learn. Um, by a long time with this course, I mean 10 to 15 days. Um, but your second programming language will take half that long, and your third, uh, half that long again. So once you understand the structure of a program, syntax of a programming language, um, the process of compiling, debugging, and rebuilding your program, um, you're off to the races. And so starting with C, is going to be a great foundational language for you. So if you've not programmed before, don't worry, we're going to create the first program. If you have programmed before, um, I think you'll move through this really quickly um, and you'll find it really straightforward. So a computer program is just simply a list of instructions that we want the computer to perform. And so we have to specify that list of instructions, and in this case, we're going to use the C programming language to specify them. And so typically our C program will start out as an ASCII file, one that you might create with the Windows Notepad utility or another um, text editor, Notepad++, not one that you create with your word processor because it's going to embed symbols that we can't see behind the scenes that do paragraph alignment and things. So you need to start with an ASCII editor. Whichever one you use is your choice. If you use one of the web-based um, C++ compilers, you can just use those and type in your program code right on those there. Um, but the key point is we're going to start with an ASCII file. It typically has the .c extension to tell people who look at the file name that it's a C program. And then we're going to compile that program using a C compiler. The compiler is going to produce several different files. It'll produce object files if it was successfully compiled, and then it'll link those um, to create an executable file. We'll talk about that process a little more in um, the details, but ultimately we want to get an executable file that our program um, can run on any given computer. So if we're building our um, C programs on Windows, we're going to build an executable that can run on Windows. If we're using Mac OS, we'll build a Mac executable. If we're using Linux, we'll build a Linux executable. And so we can use the same C source file on each one of those systems. The compiler, however, will say, what's my target system? What's my target operating system? And build the corresponding executable file. And so this is just a simple C program that displays the message, hello world, on this screen. Don't worry about what include standard io.h means right now, or what in main void means, or even what the printf statement does. We're going to talk about that. But we're going to go through the compilation process right now. I'm going to say run. And the C compiler is going to change this source code into an executable that my computer can run. And sure enough, 
it runs and displays the message, hello world, which is what our printf statement that we'll talk about told it to do. And so we start with our ASCII file, the compiler converts that to an executable, and then runs it. And so whether you're doing that on the Mac, on Linux, or on a Windows-based system, the process is going to be the same. We'll create our text file, we'll compile our text file, that'll give us an executable, that's our program that we can run. So again, I want to repeat kind of the compilation process. That's the process where we start with our C source file. We can compile and link it. Um, we don't really need to understand linking yet. We'll talk about that in the future. Um, but when we do that, the C compiler is going to check to see that we followed all the rules of C. I Meaning we place our semicolons in the right place. We close our double quotes. We use braces correctly. And if not, it's going to display a syntax error message. We'll take a look at some of those, and typically they'll kind of point us in the direction of the error that we made so we can fix it. Um, we'll go back into our editor, make the change, add the semicolon if we forgot it, and then we'll compile our program until finally we work through the syntax errors, and then we'll get an executable program that we can run. Once we do that, we'll test our program to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. If it doesn't, we have what's called a logic error, meaning our program runs, but it just doesn't do what we wanted it to do. Something's wrong with our programming logic. At that point in time, we'll look at our program, find a mistake, edit it. We'll have to recompile it again to build another executable. So each time we create a program or make changes to a program, we have to recompile it to build a new executable so we can actually run those program's instructions. To build a C program or to build a Java program or a C++ program or a Python program, you have to have the corresponding software in your system, meaning you need a C compiler or a C++ compiler or a C sharp compiler, or you need to install Python on your system. So one of your first steps is to choose your compiler. As you're just getting started, there's lots of compilers that you can download on the um, internet for free, um, and they'll work great. Um, ultimately, you'll want to get a nice system with an integrated development environment and IDE such as Visual Studio or um, a more advanced system. But one of my recommendations for people who are just starting is to take advantage of one of the web-based compilers. And so I'm going to show you a couple here, um, but you can just go to the address that's shown in the address bar and type in your C program and you can see there's a run button. The compiler resides on that system out in the internet, so it will let you edit your code, compile your code, and then ultimately run your code. So you can see in this case, we've got that same program, and it's doing the hello world message. And when we run it, sure enough, we see hello world. And here's another one, a web-based compiler, and we put our code in on the left-hand side, and here's our hello world printf statement. And when we run it, it shows a hello world message. And so there's no fast way to get started than to leverage one of these compilers. For each one of the lessons in this um, course, you've got a PDF that has all of the corresponding source code, all the C programming statements. And you can just cut and paste right from that PDF into these web compilers. And so the time to, for you to test and try a program presented in this course should just be a matter of seconds and you'll be good to go. So I wanted to, before we dove into our first program, kind of give you the typical structure of a C program. And again, don't worry about what includes standard IO.h or int main void does. Um, we're going to get into each one of those aspects. But in general, a C program starts with one or more include statements that tells the C um, preprocessor, which is part of the compiler, the names of some files that contain definitions that we want to include in our program hence the name. And header files typically have the .h extension, so you can see in this case we're including a header file called standardio.h. And it turns out that that file has definitions for um, a lot of our file operations. It has definitions for um, standard input and standard output devices, which typically correspond to the keyboard and screen display. And following those include statements, we'll typically have some function definitions. And later in this course, we'll go into functions in detail, but um, quickly, to, as programs grow in size, programmers will typically break them into smaller, more manageable pieces called functions. Each function does a specific task. 
The printf function, for example, displays um, information to the screen display. Our main program, where it says int main void, that's showing where our main program starts. When we run a C program, we may have lots of functions in our program, but the execution where the program starts will always begin in the main function. And so you can think of it as our main program. Within the braces that define the main program, the left and right facing braces, um, we'll declare some variables that allow us to store data as our programs execute. And then we'll have our program statements, the instructions that we want our program to perform. And so you're going to start seeing this structure of a C program over and over and over, probably 500 times as we go through all the programs in this book. Um, but I just wanted to give you a feel for it before we look at our first one. So our first program is the Hello World program. And Hello World is kind of a famous program. When Kerninghan and Ritchie created the C programming language to help them and with their Unix development, um, Kerninghan later wrote a book on the C programming language and his first application that he wrote was a simple program that displayed the message Hello World. And so the first program a lot of C programmers ever created was the Kerninghan Hello World application. Since that time, as other programming languages, Java, C++, C Sharp, came onto the market, book authors kind of followed suit. And the first programs they would show was typically, how do I display the message Hello World? And so developers are really familiar with Hello World because it's kind of the first application that you create, regardless of the programming language you're using. So this is our Hello World implementation. The very first line, the pound sign includes standard io.h is including a special header file that comes with the C compiler that has definitions of um, files, standard inputs, standard outputs, where um, C will be writing its um, output, getting its input. And so it's always almost the first line of every C program that you can create. And it's actually possible, depending on your compiler, that you can take a look at um, the file's contents. Um, it won't be real meaningful yet, but as we move through this course, its contents will be all things that you'll begin to recognize. Our main program, where the program's execution starts in C, is always a function called main. And so you can see that we have a line called int main void. And so an operating system exists to help us run programs. And the C programs we create are no exception. When a program runs, the operating system can pass our command line to it. We'll see how it does that, and we'll see what we can do with it. Um, if you've ever executed a command from the MS-DOS prompt or the Linux system prompt, you've executed a command line. Maybe you said, copy one file to another. Those are called your command line arguments. In this case, the void is telling the C compiler, we're not going to be using any of the command line arguments. We've got a really simple program. Its purpose is to just display the message, hello world. We don't care what other information the user might type on the command line, we're just going to display hello world. The int that precedes the function name main tells the compiler that it's going to return a value of type int, integer, to the operating system that the operating system can use to determine did the program run and exit successfully. And again, we're going to take a look at different ways that you can specify um, this main function. But throughout this book, you're going to see int main void over and over and over. Our program statements, in some programming languages, they have a begin and they have an end, and we put our statements in between those two. In C, you can think of the right-facing brace as the begin, and the left-facing brace that's down on the last line as the end. Our statements go in between those two. Printf is a function that's provided by the C programming language. And it allows us to display text, numbers, symbols to the screen display. In this case, we're telling printf, we want to display the message, hello world. And so when we run this program, we'll compile and run it. Sure enough, we see the output, hello world. And so this is our first C program. There's a lot going on, but it's going to start becoming pretty familiar to you. Um, every program in this course that you Create, you'll start with the include standard io.h in between the uh, less than and greater than symbols. Our main program will typically be called int main parentheses void. We'll see how to use 
um, those parentheses later to pass plan line arguments. Our statements will fall between braces and see they call that a compound statement, anything in between braces. And so we have multiple statements here, but we just have one. We have the printout, hello world. And so if you're typing this, you need to type it exactly as it appears here. Um, otherwise you risk violating one of the rules of um, the C programming language itself and it will later display a syntax error. We'll see those in a few minutes. Um, but if I use the lowercase m for main, you need to use the lowercase m for main. If I've got double quotes around the hello world, you've got to put double quotes around the hello world. You can see that our printf statement ends with a semicolon. The semicolon separates um, multiple statements within um, C programs, and so we need to put it at the end of each one of our statements. And so these are just rules or part of the C programming syntax. And so if you're running this in a web-based browser, you can type it yourself, or you can just copy and paste um, the code from the PDF that accompanies this lesson. So we talked about the fact that every language, be it English, French, or German, has a set of rules. We put a period at the end of a sentence, we put an exclamation mark at the end of a sentence. If we're asking a question, we put a question mark. C is no different. It has a set of rules that we have to follow when we create our programs. And so if we break one of the rules, we're said to have created a syntax error. And when a syntax error occurs, C won't build our executable program until we fix the error. And so let's take a look at this first program. It looks pretty good. It looks like a lot like the one we just ran. But when we try and run it, we get a lot of output from the compiler. And it says, hey, something's wrong here. You've got some kind of um, problem. And so we need to go back and look at, oh, what did we do? And if we look closely, we can see that we forgot the ending quote in our printf statement. And so we can add that quote. And try again, and it's now saying, I've not seen this definition for printf. Oh, if we look, we didn't say printf, we just said print. So if we add the T, we can run it again, and we get our message. So we fix those syntax errors. Now let's look at this next one. And so at first, syntax errors can be a little bit frustrating. You'll be saying, boy, it's close enough. And so we, if we run this one, if we take a look at our syntax error message, it tells us I expected a semicolon before the left facing brace. And if we look, sure enough, we forgot our semicolon. So our syntax error was really helpful to us. We can add our semicolon, come back and run it. All the rules are good. The C compiler will produce our executable and our program ran. And so as you program more and more, you'll start seeing fewer syntax errors. But make sure you take time to read the syntax error message. It will normally give you a hint as to what the problem is. After we get all the syntax errors corrected and we can successfully compile our program, then we need to worry about logic errors or bugs. And so logic errors are just things that are indications that our programming logic um, isn't correct. There, there's a bug in it. The term bug dates back to Oh, years ago, 1950s, when they were working with computers that filled up the size of your house um, and vacuum tubes, the program wasn't running successfully. And Dr. Grace Hopper um, went back in the hallways of the vacuum tubes and found a tube that had a moth that was sh in it and that was shorting out the tube. She pulled the, mug out, the moth out, and so that was a bug in the computer. And so she was the first one to debug a computer. The term is um, stuck since then. But if we take a look at our first program, it's using printf, we're used to that now, and it's displaying a message, this is line one, followed by printf, this is line two. And so we should expect to see two lines of output, but when we run our program, we see the output of both of them on the same line. We've got a bug somewhere in our logic. And so what we didn't include was the slash n at the end of a character string tells C to advance the cursor to the start of the next new line. And so when we correct our program and add it and run this program, sure enough, we see this is line one, this is line two. So two types of errors you're going to see. Syntax errors when you violate the 
rules of the programming language and logic errors when something about your instructions is not correct. So we said that a program is a list of instructions that the computer executes. And so far, our instruction has been the printf statement to display the message, hello world. But we can add additional statements to our program. In this case, we have a hello world message. Then we've got one that says, hello, Chris. You have one that says, C is easy. You can see that at the end of each message, I've got the slash n to advance the cursor. So our lines will appear sequentially as opposed to all the data being on one line. And nothing else has changed. My include standard io.h is the same. My int main void is the same. All my statements are appearing within the left and right braces. And I've got semicolons at the end of each one. So we're looking pretty good. And when we run the program, sure enough, we see our output. Hello world, hello Chris, C is easy. And so as you add statements, you just put one after another. This is called sequential programming. Our program's gonna execute the first statement encounters, followed by the second, followed by the third. And later lessons, we'll learn how to teach our computer programs how to make decisions using an if-else statement or to repeat statements using a for or while loop. Um, so this is sequential processing one statement after the next, after the next, until we get to the last one in the program ends. So one of the rules of the C programming language is that it's case sensitive, meaning C treats upper and lower case characters differently. And so in this case, you see we have one statement, printf, hello world, but our printf is in upper case. And you can see that everything else is in lower case. And so that's not the same as the printf we've been using before. To see, that's a different printout. Now, if we try and run this program, we'll get a syntax error that says, I don't know what printf is. And so if we come back in and correct it, make it a lowercase p, rerun our program, sure enough, we get our hello world. So as you're typing your program, just keep in back your mind that to see an uppercase letter is different than a lowercase letter. And if we have a name that starts with an uppercase, it's different than the same exact name, starting with the lowercase. So some terms I just want you to be familiar with, we've got header files, we've got our source files, which are our program files that have the C extension. Behind the scenes, when we compile and build our programs, we get linker object files. We may have some library files because C provides a library of routines that our programs can use that we don't have to write, that we can take advantage of. So, for example, if we need the square root of a number, we don't have to write code to calculate the square root. We can use the square root function that's built in to C. And then finally, we get executable program, assuming all's gone well and we haven't violated any the rules of the syntax. And so, behind the scenes, you, you don't always see these files, particularly if you're working from a web-based compiler, but you need to know that they exist. Header files, source files, linker files, library files, executable files because other programmers will be aware of them and may talk about them. We've talked about the fact that at the start of our programs, we'll typically see an include statement that includes standard io.h. And we said it defines a lot of our file operations, a lot of our function definitions. And so it, it defines, for example, standard out, which is our normally associated to our screen display, standard in, which is normally associated with our keyboard. It defines the printf statement. And so in the first um, program, we've done things right. We've got our header file at the top. And when we run it, we see our hello world message. Our second one doesn't include the header file. And so when we run it, we get warning messages. It still managed to build an executable and run it, but it said, hey, I've not seen um, printf before. Did you forget to include standard io.h at the top of your program? Sure enough, we did. If we go back and put it in, this warning message will go away. As our programs grow in size and complexity, they can become confusing to read. And so to help in our program, or to remind us if we've not looked at a program in a week or two, what it's doing, what processing it's performing, we add comments. And comments exist to just kind of document our code. C supports two forms of a comment. The first is just the double slash, and you can see I'm using it in the first program. So I've got slash slash hello C, 
slash slash written by Chris Shapes, slash slash state written. So when the C compiler encounters the double slash on a line, it will ignore everything else on that line. It'll assume there's no more program statements. And so it encounters some rapid bat with the comment for hello C, the written by. So it's just ignoring all those. The comments exist to help us and other programmers read our program. You can see the line with include standard io.h has a comment after the inclusion. And so it says this is needed for printf. Um, when the C compiler encounters those double slashes, it's going to ignore everything to the right. And so our program um, will pick up on the next line. Older C programs use a different form of commenting and it's a slash followed by an asterisk is the start of our comment. And you can see four lines down, we have an asterisk followed by a slash. That's the end of our comment. So we didn't have to do the double slash. We just um, were able to group our comments in between those two symbols. And so in this program, I'm using both comment forms and techniques, um, the older form and then the slash slash form. And I don't necessarily have a preference which one you use, as long as you use comments to document your code. And so you'll get better at commenting as you see other example programs and see what people are commenting along the way. But we want to put comments in to explain the processing that our program is doing. So if another programmer picks up our code, they can read the comments and have a good idea as to what we we're intending. One of the ways that we can use comments is to turn off program statements and so if we're trying to debug our program, trying to find out where the error is at, sometimes it's convenient to just say, don't execute this set of um, program statements. I want to see if the error is in there or if it's outside of them. So let's take a look at how we might do that. We've got our program. It's got um, three printf statements. It's printing out the message, message one, followed by message two, followed by message three. So when we run our program, Sure enough, we see those three messages. But if we can come in with our comment, we can turn off the second statement by going slash slash. So we've now commented out, is the terminology for it, that second statement. When we rerun it, the C compiler will encounter the two slashes and say, I'm ignoring everything on that line. So we should not see the message two displayed. So let's rerun it. And sure enough, we see message one and message three. And so as you're debugging code, as you're trying to find errors and isolate errors, sometimes it's convenient to comment out code. And then when you get things working, you can just delete the comments and the code will be right back. That way you're not deleting code and having to retype it. You're just commenting it out. So most C programs will consist of multiple programming instructions or statements. And at the end of each statement, we need to place a semicolon. The semicolon in C separates statements. And so if we take a close look at this one, it's, it's printing out the message, this is line one, followed by the message, this is line two. But our printf statements, each one should have a semicolon following them. In this case, we've got a syntax error. So when we run our program, it's gonna tell us, hey, I expected a semicolon. And sure enough, if we go back in and put our semicolon in place, we rerun our program, we'll see our correct output. So most statements are going to end with a semicolon in C. You can think of it as a statement separator. When we compile our programs, there's times that our syntax error is so big that the C compiler will say, that's it, I'm not building an executable, and you're gonna have to fix it before we go on. Other times, the C compiler will say, um, there's just simply a, a warning, and I'm gonna build your executable. When you get those warning messages, you may say, oh, I was successful, I built my executable, I've got program that runs. You should stop and take some time to read the compiler warnings. Normally, it's a good indicator that there's something that you can and should fix. And so let's take a look at this program. We've got our include standard io.h, that looks good. Typically, we'll see int main void. As you encounter older C programs, you may see some that just start with main and they don't specify the int in front of them. This used to be a common programming technique, um, but it's not as standard today. We specify the type of value that the program's returning to the operating system. So if we try and compile this program, it will compile and run it, but it's displaying a warning. It's saying the 
return type has defaulted to int. And I said, you should read those and do something about it so you can get rid of them. In this case, we're just gonna add the word int, rerun our code, and sure enough, it's gone. So just because your program successfully compiles, but has warnings, don't deem yourself successful. Go back and fix the code to eliminate those warnings. And so we've seen int main void quite a few times throughout this um, lesson. You will also encounter in the second program, void main void. The void at the start of the line tells the operating system or the um, compiler that we're not returning a value to the operating system. And so if we're successful, we're not gonna return a value. If we're not successful, we're not gonna return a value. You'll see a lot of programs use void main void, particularly newer programs. And different compilers will treat it differently. Some compilers like to have the int instead. You may also see, as in our third example, where we just have main, and it doesn't have an int in front of it, and it doesn't have a void in between the parentheses. This is common in older code. Um, all these um, programs will compile and run. Um, some will display warnings, but you may encounter all of them. And then let's take a look at this last one because it's fun. Um, we said that when you run a command from the command line, the information you type, the copy file one to copy file two, becomes the command line. Well, C was designed for command line processing. And so it allows the operating system to pass it information um, about the command line. And so that int argc will tell us the number of parameters the user included on the command line. So if they've got the command line copy file, the file B, we'd have three command line arguments. The care argv, and we're gonna look at this in detail, we've got a whole lesson on it, is um, the actual command line arguments themselves. And so you'll see a lot of C programs that start with the int, that's the value that's returned to the operating system. The int argc, that's the number of command line arguments. And then the care argv with the brackets, and those are our command line arguments themselves. And so you'll, you may see your main program in any one of these formats. But for most of the programs in this course, we're gonna use the int main void format. So what are we gonna learn next? Um, we'll learn that as they execute, programs store data in variables. And the variable has a name, um, but it also has a specific type, such as integer or floating point or character. And that type defines a set of values a variable can store, as well as a set of operations the program can perform on the variable. So it makes sense to add integer values. One plus one is equals two. It makes sense to work multiplication with floating point values. 3.2 times 5.5. It doesn't make sense to do multiplication on a character string, such as a user's name. And so a variable is going to define a set of values, and it's also going to define a set of operations. So in the next lesson, we'll learn how we create variables in our programs, assign values to them, and then later display those values using printf.